Well, today we're going to get a rare peek into the childhood of Jesus. Now, sometimes you'll turn on a channel on television and they'll, they'll think they're going to tell you secrets about the life of Jesus, but it's usually based upon old writings, but writings that were written long, long after the time that the New Testament period was lived in, not like the New Testament itself. Uh, we're not going to do any of that this morning. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to a pseudo-history or, or things that people just made up a couple hundred years after the time of Christ. We're going to look right here in the book of Luke and to get a peek at the life of Jesus when he was a child. Uh, and we're going to look at an episode where Joseph and Mary actually lost Jesus. Now think about that. They couldn't find their little boy, you know, the one that was announced by the angels. Have you ever had that moment, those of you with children, you're maybe in the store and usually has to do with clothes racks. But you're there, one moment, your kids are, you know, running around your legs. Next minute you turn around and, where are, one, two, three, wait, one, one, where are all your kids? You know, that's a lot scarier than losing your wallet or your car keys or a passport. None of that can compare. Now I want you to magnify that, multiply that, imagine, Mary, what are we going to tell God? <laughs> imagine how terrified Joseph and Mary were when they realized the chosen one was gone. In the spirit of the Disney movies, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and the sequel, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, starring Rick Moranis, I decided to title this sermon, Honey, I Think We Lost the Messiah. <laughs> and you know what? I wonder if Joseph and Mary each realized it at different moments, or was it one of those things they just looked at each other and knew what the other one was saying? But it's kind of embarrassing after you realize I haven't seen my kid for 10 hours to say to your wife, by the way, have you seen Jesus? And she also didn't want to mention it because it sounds like bad parenting and was hoping that he knew where he was the whole time. Well, he must be with some friends or with some relatives in the caravan. Honey, I think we lost the Messiah. Luke chapter 2 from verse 41. <clears throat> I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. We just sang that song about the blood, right? That's the story of Passover. When the Jewish people were captive in Egypt, and God, after you know, 400 years after, God was about to bring them out of Egypt, and he was sending the plagues upon Pharaoh and the Egyptian people, uh, God was going to bring this uh, spirit of judgment upon Egypt. All the firstborn children were going to die. The only way that you could avoid this judgment was to take the blood of a lamb that they had specially set aside, take the blood and apply it to the doorpost of the house. Then the spirit of judgment, when it passed over and it saw that the blood was applied, the wrath of God would pass over that family. And so the Jewish people would celebrate this, celebrate this time when God delivered by coming together for Passover. And here, Jesus' family was also coming to Passover. And how, what an amazing thing to think that little toddler Jesus, little six-year-old, seven-year-old Jesus, 10-year-old, 11-year-old Jesus, going year after year, and he was being set aside and prepared to be the Passover lamb. Jesus would be the lamb of God. And he would give his blood, his life, because each one of us in this room, and I'm looking at a lot of wonderful people, each one of us has this sin in our lives, this rebellion against God. The things that we say and that we do that are contrary to the will of God, the things that we say and that we do that hurt those we love, hurt those around us. And the Bible tells us that when we accept the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, and we apply the blood to our hearts, to our lives, the wrath of God will pass over us. The reason is because Jesus took all the wrath upon himself on the cross. There's none left over. There's no more judgment left. 
because he took it all upon himself on the cross. If you've accepted the blood of Jesus Christ, then we're set free, and there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I want you to think about that. This little boy Jesus, he's the Lamb of God. Remember what his, what his uh, relative John the Baptist said when he first saw Jesus? He said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So every year, Jesus' uh, parents went to Jerusalem for the festival, over, festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. In, uh, although Passover was a day, there was usually a, a week-long festival connected with it. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus decided to stay behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking that he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Now, I remember once when I was kind of evil. And we were just little kids. And uh, we got into the car. And Mom and Dad started to pull away. And I started to say, one of my brothers is at the big boy bathroom. What? Dad looked at we're talking, be quiet. <laughs> because I was a little jerk. And so I thought, well, that'll teach him. But uh, we, didn't, we didn't get very far. I think we were still in the parking lot. I think he said the boys are still in the bathroom. <laughs> One of the brothers is still in the bathroom. So we stopped and we got him. Uh, imagine going a day and you're riding on donkeys or camels or walking on foot. Hard trekking, and you just lost your child in a big city where there's, like any big city, there's some bad people. And on top of that, there are people from all over the world coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so it's even bigger than normal. The city of Jerusalem swells with all of these people coming from all over the known world to celebrate Passover, and you're thinking any one of these people could abduct my child and and take them to India or Spain or, or, or Parthia or any place in no, uh, northern Africa. In, and so they go a days on their journey, and they realize, honey, I think we've lost the Messiah. Uh, then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And at first, a little confidently, you know, they got a little more nervous. Check in that backpack. What? I said, check in the backpack, Okay. Then they began looking among, uh, among him and their relatives and friends. When he did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. That was embarrassing, too, to the relatives and friends. Yeah, we misplaced our child. The one you're saying is so special. Yeah. So they have to go back to Jerusalem. After three days, they found him in the temple courts. After three days. Now, some people say that was... Uh, one day out, one day back, and then on the third day. Some, day. some people think they went one day out, one day back, and then looked for three days in Jerusalem. I'm not quite sure which is which. Uh, but after three days, uh, after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Everyone, by the way, if anyone says it's wrong to ask questions, they're not following Jesus' example, are they? Uh, I keep hearing about all these people who say, I left the church because I wasn't allowed to ask questions. Well, I don't understand that. Go ahead and ask your questions. And uh, those of you who are worried about people asking questions, maybe you've got to worship a bigger God who's not afraid of the questions himself. Uh, verse 47, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. The word astonished means they were beside themselves. His mother said to him, and I don't care if this is 2,000 years later, doesn't this sound like a mom? Son, why have you treated us like this? And I'm guessing she was shaking and had tears. Son, why have you treated, like, uh, treated your mother and father like this? Your father and I, you ever, anybody ever recognize that line? Your father and I have been anxiously, anxiously searching for you. And Jesus, now he's lucky he's the Messiah, 
Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? And I'm thinking, Joseph, because he knew how special this child was, was not quite sure how to deal with this. Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. The next part's interesting that they included this in here. And I'm, I'm imagining Mary telling this story to Luke, the investigator, who wants to record all the stories down. And Luke has this story uh, that Matthew didn't. And, and then he went down to Nazareth with them. And he was obedient to them or subjected himself to them. So because it's proper for a 12-year-old, it's proper for a, a child while well, they're in their parents' home to be obedient to their parent. And so Jesus, even though he was perfect and his parents were not, uh, he does things perfectly, and part of that means he obeyed his parents. And so he went down with them and was obedient to them. Uh, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Haven't we come across that phrase before in, in Luke here? So she treasured these things in her heart. that She reflected on them. And as Jesus grew up, he increased in wisdom and in favor with God and all people. Now, I think that the purpose of this entire section is to report an actual event in the life of Christ. This is an historical event. This happened. Uh, Luke is, is recording it because Mary told it to him. And so the purpose of the section we just read is to tell us about this event that actually happened. It probably had a big impact on, on Mary. And again, she was no doubt, right? She was no doubt the source of this story uh, for Luke's gospel. And we were, these first two chapters in Luke have told us a number of events from Jesus' birth, his infancy, and his childhood that all clearly pointed to him being no ordinary child. So the, Luke decides to start his gospel out different than Matthew, different than Luke, way different than John, by telling all these stories, many of them we, we recite during Christmas time, about Jesus when he was just a baby, when he was just a little boy. And, and I can imagine, because Mary, it says she treasured these things. Around. She's sharing her treasures with him. And all of these things tell us Jesus was not a normal little child. He was no ordinary. Now, every parent thinks their child is not ordinary. And uh, guess what? Uh, this is going to sound like a contradiction, but you're right. Every child is unique and very special. Uh, every child is different. But we're talking about something very different here. There's something really, really different here going on. Mary shared with us her conversation with the angel Gabriel. Now, a lot of people can say, yeah, I spoke with an angel. But Mary's story was vindicated by Jesus performing all these miracles and then rising from the dead. Then you go back and say, yeah, maybe it was a virgin birth. Just because somebody tells you it's a virgin birth or I spoke to angels, you don't believe them. We, have, we saw Mary's word vindicated by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So... Jesus was born, and he was announced uh, beforehand by uh, uh, this mighty angel. Uh, she tells us about her relatives, Beth and in, uh, in Zach, and in, in how uh, their baby boy was expected to prepare the way, that's John the Baptist, prepare the way for her baby's uh, ministry. Uh, the surprising visit from the shepherds who brought an amazing story. And again, we heard that Mary treasured and she pondered these things in her heart. The things that shepherds were saying, out, just come out from the fields and, and these amazing things that they shared and how they saw a host of angels. We saw the prophecies of Simeon and, and old Anna there in the temple. We saw those last week. All these events reinforcing to Joseph and Mary that their child was special. Their child was going to change the world and guess what the world since christ has never been the same as the world before christ the world is totally different because of the person of jesus christ things that we take for granted about valuing human life and the dignity of human life uh, came to us more completely and more fully in the person of jesus christ and through his ministry and his followers than the world ever saw before that and then luke records this event the time Mary and Joseph lost their young son. Now, I, I wonder if Mary kind of didn't want to tell that story. Wouldn't that have been an embarrassing story to tell? Yeah, we lost our kid. 
Wait, wait, wait. He's, he's got it. What did you say again? <laughs> the one that you said was announced by angels and was so special and the one that you were so sure was going to change the whole world and you just left Jerusalem and you didn't have him with you and you an hour, two hours, three hours, a whole day went by before you guys started to get uneasy about it. Yeah, well, we got uneasy about it, but we thought he was up in front or running around or somewhere. He was such a good boy. He wouldn't run away from home. He was always so good. We just figured he was with us. You know, the other kids we had to keep track of, but he was pretty good staying with us. And Luke said, mm-hmm. And he, <laughs> and he wrote it down. <clears throat> I wonder when she revealed this story, this memory to Luke, did she laugh at herself? Was she embarrassed? Did she still almost feel like crying at the very memory of losing her boy in the big city? So honestly, I don't think that today's reading is that complex. There's not a lot of hidden theology here we can plumb, we can, we can investigate, we can dig out and see what's there. It's simply a record of the time Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem while his family went home and he was found in the temple. And what was he doing there? He was impressing everyone, the spiritual leaders, the common people, everyone around him was impressed at the depth of his understanding. This 12-year-old boy was speaking truth and his questions were digging, uh, probing. It's another pivotal moment in Christ's life before his public ministry that lets us know Jesus is not like any other person that has ever lived. So if you're going to put your faith in anybody, if you're going to, we have a word in English called faith, right? I like to say trust because faith sounds so mystical. Trust. If you're going to put your trust in anyone, who else are we going to find in all of history, alive today or in the past, who would be more worthy of our trust, of our faith, than Jesus Christ? He's unlike anybody else. Still, there are things that we can glean, some practical applications from this story. For one, please pay attention. Next time you're riding a donkey in a caravan and you are leaving a major Middle Eastern city such as Jerusalem, do not simply assume, because you know what you do to you and me when you assume, do not simply assume that your children are with your relatives or friends in the caravan, that's a bad idea. That is a really bad idea. You know, sorry, Joe and Mary, that is just, that is a really bad idea. Here's another practical application. Brothers and sisters, do you want to find Jesus? Well, some of you are saying, I already got Jesus. Well, do you want to get closer to Jesus? Look for him where people worship God. Look for him where people worship God. Look for him in his father's house. Yeah, you can be, uh, people ask me all the time, can I be a Christian and not go to church? And what they really mean is, I don't want to go to church because I don't want to deal with pastors. I don't want to go to church because I don't want to deal with the sinner behind me or in front of me or next to me. or behind, You know, I don't want to go to church because I don't like the singing, what, whatever. You know what I always tell them? Yes, you can be a disobedient Christian and not go to church. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Going to Burger King doesn't make you a hamburger. But, but, the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. The Bible is full of these one another verses where we're supposed to be working with one another, uh, sharpening one another, uh, encouraging one another, and you can't practice one another verses that are throughout the scriptures unless you're in community with God's people. And think about this. The very reason Jesus came, and I'm not speaking just to the people here, but a number of folks come up to me on tele we've seen it on television or the internet. Really appreciate them. I just want to encourage you guys, come to church. It doesn't even have to be this church. Come to, uh, go get, get your posterior up. Get to church. All of these one another verses. Jesus came, why? Because humanity had sinned in our obstinate hard-headedness. We had separated ourselves from holy God. And he wanted to bring us back into community. He wanted to bring us back into relationship. And so he paid the price we couldn't pay so that we could find a way back to God. And then Jesus, before he goes to the cross, saying, Father, my prayer is that they would be one. They would be united, just like you and I are united, that they would be in unity. And the whole idea of God being a loving God is he wants you and I and all true followers of Jesus Christ to be in community, to be
to be in relationship with one another. So yes, you can be saved and not be going to church, but that was never God's plan. That's, you cannot read the New Testament and, that's, and see that was God's plan for the, for the Christians, for the early Christians. That's not what God envisioned. We're supposed to be in this together. God is a God of relationship. God is a God of community. And if you want to do it right, and if you want that blessing, there are some blessings, like Sister Linda, when you were in the hospital, you were saying that you were, you were blessed that the sermons were on the Internet, but it's not the same, is it? You need to be with these other folks. And I'll tell you what, you may think you have nothing to gain. I can't learn anything from the sermon. Oh, yeah, you, maybe you can. Uh, you might think, and, and these people all around here, they irritate me. I'm not getting any blessing from them. Well, maybe that's true. But you're not going to be used by God to be a blessing to anybody when you're at home. So get to church and start being a blessing for other people. And anyways, Jesus said, love your enemies. So if that's what you feel about everybody at church, you're stuck anyways. Uh, brothers and sisters, if you want to grow close to Jesus, go where people worship God. Mary Joseph and Mary, where'd they have to go? They had to go to the house of the Lord. You know, you kind of wonder why they didn't check there right away. But they're running all around, checking wherever they got to check. Maybe they're going through all the McDonald's in, ta in Jerusalem. I don't know. Uh, finally, they end up at the temple, and there Jesus is with this big crowd of people around him. Uh, go where people are seeking out Jesus. Go together. Go as a group. And then together we go on this life journey. They journeyed back with Jesus. We go on our life journey with Jesus. If you've lost your connection with Christ, and you know, Christian life, uh, Christian life, there are times we say, yeah, when I was a kid, I was close to Jesus, and I was going to Sunday school class. And I still kind of believe it, but it just didn't have any effect on my life. I got busy with work, with family, with everything, the hobbies, and now I just don't even think about it. But, but I kind of feel I, I've got this tug on my heart. I need to get right with God. Or, or maybe some big event happened in your life, and you were so disappointed, and, and you were so sad, you know, death of a loved one, maybe somebody betrayed you, something. It just blew your world apart, and you just lost track of God in all that confusion. In all the chaos of a broken life, you lost track of God. You know what? The Bible says in Psalm, oh, I forgot, 33 or 34, that God is close to the brokenhearted. Well, when our heart is broken, that's an opportunity for God to come near to us. If you've lost your connection with Christ, or, or you're still connected, but it's just weak. It's not what it used to be. Or maybe you took for granted that Jesus would always be around. Yeah, he's over here. I can see him. He's with my friends. I can see him. he's with my family, so he's probably around with me as well. He's, he's around here somewhere. Just assuming that, yeah, I go to church and I, I sense that God's there. I sense the Holy Spirit's there, so everything's fine, right? But you know in your own heart that that connection isn't not what it used to be. You know what we need to do? Joseph and Mary are going the wrong direction. They need to turn around and go back. Brothers and sisters, when we're going the wrong direction in our house, heart, in our lives, we need to turn around. We need to repent. We need to head back to Jesus. We need to go back to the place where we can find him. If we've been going the wrong way, it's time to humble ourselves and say, Lord, I admit, if I go this way, I'm going away from you. I'm not going to find you, and I want to come back. I want to come back. Don't run from Jesus. Run to Jesus. We need to repent. Say, Lord, your ways are better than my ways. Lord, my attitude has been nasty. Lord, the way I've been treating people, you've revealed it to me, is not appropriate, and I don't want to be that. I don't want to do that. Lord, God, please. And we find that he's always right there. When we turn around for him, we will find the Lord. We need to repent, and we need to start, uh, uh, start talking face-to-face -face with Jesus ourselves. It's not enough if you think, well, I think Jesus is with my friends. It's not enough I think Jesus is with my family. We need to turn around and face Jesus ourselves. Now, I want to take a short teach detour here, a teachable moment, kind of a whole different path, a whole different direction here. I don't know, maybe some of you noticed this. <clears throat> I start off by saying what I think the text is about. I think it's about pointing to the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. These practical applications that I'm sharing, absolutely, 100%, they're valid. But we need to understand they aren't actually what the story was about. See what I'm saying? This practical application about turning your life around, go where God's people can be found, seek out Jesus, look for him passionately, all these things are true, but they're not what Luke was writing about. 
It was, again, simply another event that points us to the uniqueness of Christ. But these applications are reasonable things that we can draw out of the story, and that's fine, and that's good, and, and, and we often do that in the church, and that's okay, and I do it as long as I want us to be very aware. I want us to always be careful to understand that these applications are absolutely not what Dr. Luke was thinking when he wrote that gospel. You see the difference? This is a valid application of what we've just learned, but it was not the intent of what Luke was writing when he wrote this actual event in the life of Jesus Christ. Again, I want to make it clear that these applications do not represent a proper way to exegete Scripture. In other words, I'm not looking at things, when I told you those things, I wasn't looking at audience. I wasn't looking at context. I wasn't looking at genre. I wasn't looking at the author's personality and how he speaks. I wasn't looking at a culture, a cultural or historical background. But the things I said were still true. It doesn't mean that the moral and spiritual lessons that we can extract from the text aren't valid. They just aren't what was originally intended. It's important that we're talking about this because otherwise we sit like lumps on a log and people draw stuff out of scripture that's not what was originally intended there, and we need to be aware of that. Otherwise, we're going to get lazy, and we're just going to buy whatever gets shoveled to us. I often point this out. I take the time on Sunday mornings to point this out, that, that was, this is not actually a proper uh, hermeneutic. This is not the way we should be uh, dividing truth out of the scriptures, although I say it is a valid application. And if you're with me on, on Monday night or Thursday night, sometimes I'll say, you know what, brother, you know what, sister? That's absolutely a valid point. I think that you can draw that out of there, but that's not what the text is actually talking about. And so that's a way that we affirm the teaching. That's true. That's a good teaching. But let's be careful to separate that from, from discovering what that text actually was originally meant to be. Brothers and sisters, this is actually very, very important. We need to be able to understand what the text is saying, and then we can go on sometimes and draw some other uh, moral applications, spiritual applica applications, the, you know, emotional applications out of the, out of the text itself. Uh, I don't want, the reason I mention it is because I don't want to inadvertently anesthetize our church to bad hermeneutics. We, we don't want that. When we approach the Bible, I want us to think about things like, when you approach the Bible, when you're reading in your own home, you can do this. When you're in Bible study, you can do this. Ask yourself, now what's the context? I don't want to just choose a verse here, choose a verse there, cherry picking my way through the Bible, right? That's why sometimes I do topical studies, but usually what we're doing is bit by bit, bit by bit, each Sunday we're going through a little chunk of scripture and everybody tells you you need a three-part sermon. The New Testament is not written for three-part sermons. A lot of time we're just going through and sometimes in, in just a, a half a page you're going to have several different main points I'm not going to pretend like they all fit together all the time. I'm just going to go bit by bit through the scriptures, uh, what it says. So I want us to be very aware. When you go approach your Bible, ask yourself, what's the context? Ask yourself, uh, what's the genre? Ask yourself, who is the audience? Was this mit, uh, written and meant just for Jewish people uh, while they're wandering in the wilderness? You know, the... Uh, or is this written for all people at all times? An approach like that is going to help us avoid a lot of error. Amen? If we're taking a proper hermeneutic, we are going to be able to understand our scriptures a lot better. Now, with that in mind, I want to go back to this practical application, which is, again, it's valid. Uh, but it wasn't what Luke had in mind when he wrote the text. If you want to find Jesus, start with the Father's house. Don't wander around Jerusalem looking what you can run into, finding what you can find. I run into this mess. I run into that mess. I'm over here. Uh, you know, I'm over there. I'm in the market. I'm in all these different places that are selling all these different things with all these different distractions saying, why am I not close to the Lord? If you want to find Jesus, go to his father's house. <coughs> Get into a good Bible-believing church. Listen. I hope we pack this place out. I hope, I hope that God has in mind for us that we're going to pack this place out so much every Sunday that very soon we're going to be looking for a new building. Wouldn't that be fun? But listen, get to a good Bible-believing church. It doesn't have to be foundation. My heart is that everybody 
will plug themselves in, that they will get part of a good church. I regularly pray, and, and my family knows this, I'm regularly praying for other uh, faith communities, for other churches in our community. When I drive by a church, when I go to Beloit, when I'm going through Janesville, when I'm going through the countryside, and I see a little country church, I'm often praying, Lord, let something beautiful go on there. Lord, let your word be preached fearlessly. I, I pray that there's life transformation. I pray that so many people are coming to faith in you, Lord. Please strengthen those pastors. Please strengthen their congregation. Please give them all the financial resources they need. I'm praying for other churches, churches all the time. I am proud of our church. I love our church. I'm thrilled with the people God has put together. I'm never, I'm, and I'm a champion of our church, and I wish more people were here. But I can be that, and at the same time, love other churches and thank, say, thank you, God, what you're doing in that church. It's so good, so beautiful. Please prosper their ministry. So here's the point. Don't sit at home. Sometimes when you're too sick, you got to be at home, right? That's why you're, sometimes you watch on the Internet or, or the television. But don't s stay at home. You need brothers. You need sisters. You need to work through the difficulty of relationships. Relationships are messy. Relationships are hard, and you need to learn how to be a good forgiver, and you need to learn how to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and you need to uh, work on being able to give grace to people who don't deserve it. And remember, God gave me grace that I don't deserve. We need to work hard for these relationships. So by all means, find a church. And I don't care if there's no such thing as a perfect church. You ain't perfect either. In fact, you go to the church, it will no longer be perfect. <coughs> so get into a church. And then uh, I'm going to steal a little Torian's thunder. He's probably going to be giving his testimony shortly. I don't know if it's next week, hopefully. But uh, he said when he decided, he was talking to a, a, a co-worker at work, and uh, a, everybody at his work has noticed a big change in his life. He said, when I became a Christian, I didn't dip my toe in. I jumped into the deep end. <laughs> When you get into a church, yeah, you can look around, find the right church for you and your family, find that church, but you know what? Once you make that decision, quit, quit the steeplechase. Steep, quit bouncing around. Find a church and commit to those people. Commit to that. Put yourself under the leadership of those pastors. Get involved. Plug in. Make friends. Put in an effort. Joseph and Mary searched tirelessly. They didn't give up because finding Jesus was too important. Don't give up. Getting close to Jesus is way too important to say, you know what, hon, we tried, but I'd rather sleep in Sunday mornings anyways. You know, hon, we tried, but it wasn't really a good match for the kids, or, or it wasn't like I remembered when I was growing up. You know how that first church is always so dear to your heart? You measure every other church against it. And so we can, Aaron, remember I said this, what, five years ago, four years ago? Any creative person can think of a reason not to be at church. You don't have to be a genius to find a reason to say, I don't want to go to church. But to not give up on people, to suffer long together, to learn to love one another and forgive one another, we're going to kind of need the Holy Spirit for that. We're going to need, we're going to need some supernatural action in our lives, in the life of our church, to be able to hold on to, to one another and do things God's way. Anybody can get ticked off and storm out, but we need the Holy Spirit in order to stay together. Joseph and Mary, Jesus was too important to walk away from. They were not going to leave Jesus. Brothers and sisters, did you know that the church is actually called the body of Christ? Did you know the church is called the bride of church, Christ? I got a wife that I love. You guys know ain't nobody going to mess with Yumi. Seriously. How do you think Jesus feels when people badmouth the church all the time? I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the church. It's his bride. Let's watch ourselves. Let's watch how we talk about his precious bride. You know, the one he died for, the one he loves, the one that he's purifying and making beautiful and dressing her in white and making, making her without wrinkle, the Bible tells us. Jesus loves the church, and we're looking forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're looking forward to, to God bringing his people home. And meanwhile, we sit here and say, well, I don't go to church because boom, 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 boom. And Jesus says, and you think you're all that. 
Get into a church. Get into a church. Joseph and Mary looked with all their strength, and they found what they were looking for. They found Jesus. They found their son. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Lord, I need a church. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Lord, I need my sins forgiven. Lord, I've been messing up in my life. Lord, I just went on with my life, and just suddenly I realized... <clears throat> Japanese call that sudden enlightenment, satori, satori. Suddenly I realized I'm out here. My kids don't love Jesus. I'm not going to church. My marriage is falling apart. Nothing's going right. And I used to believe this. I used to go. It was my, I need to get back. I need to get back. And you stop going on that road away, and you take that repentance, and you go back, and you make your peace with the living God. And Jesus said, if we seek for him, we will certainly find him. Just turn back, turn back. Well, we worship a good God. I really want to encourage all of you, if you feel that there's some barrier between you and God, we've got to repent of our sins, we need to confess our sins. If there's some barrier, if we think there's some obstacle between ourselves and Jesus, guess what? He's not the one barring the door. He's not the one closing the door. But if we come back in humility and say, Lord, forgive. Your ways are better than my ways. Lord, I just want to be with you. You will absolutely find Jesus right there for you. And you will find that Jesus is not quick to anger and he's not looking for excuses to hold a grudge over us, but he's quick to forgive and he's eager to bring us back into relationship with him. So no matter what you've done, no matter what your history is like, no matter how dead spiritually these last few years of your life have been, no matter how empty you feel on the inside, I want to tell you Turn around, get back, go to where God's people are finding Jesus. Get together with Jesus. Pursue him uh, with all your strength, and you will find Jesus, and you will have that relationship with the Lord that you've been looking for. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads, and ask for that right now. Dear Lord God, here we are, and we want you, and we need you. We can feel this in our soul, Lord, this place where you're meant to be, Father. Lord, we, we confess that every time we turn our eyes away from you that we make a mess of our lives. We act like hind ends, Lord. We can be so self-righteous, so hard-headed. We can make, uh, we make ourselves miserable. We make the people around us miserable, Lord. And we are not called to that, Lord. You've called us to a higher purpose, Lord. Help us to see you as you really are. Father, help us to understand that you love us just as we are. Father, help us to understand that you have a plan for us to, to change us and mold us and make us more like you, Father. Help us to to want to be near you so that we can become good people that are in love with goodness, in love with peace, in love with joy, Lord. Help us to be thankful people. And Father, I pray that we treat other people around us in our families, our coworkers, our neighbors, people in church, Lord, that we treat them the way you want us to, Lord, not the way we sometimes just feel. Father, help us to be a blessing to others and not a curse. Lord, here we are, and we want to be your people. Father, you see our sins, but we believe that you dealt with all of that stuff on the cross, and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for suffering for our sins. Now, Lord, we ask, help us. Help us to live for you. Help us to love you with everything we've got, and help us to love other people. And Father, help us to love people that don't know you yet enough to bring them into the church and help them uh, get in relationship with your son, Jesus. Again, Father, you put love in our hearts for you. Thank you for that. Lord, we want to love you more. Help us to walk in your light. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church. Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.